John Carl with some more news breaking out of the White House. John, this talk of the 25th Amendment apparently getting quite real. Uh, it is, George. Uh, I am told that there have been discussions among some members of the Trump cabinet of invoking the 25th Amendment. Uh, I have also, uh, I'm also told and aware of conversations among uh, some of the president's allies in Congress. They wouldn't have a role in that, uh, but talking about this as a very real possibility. Uh, one ally of the president uh, told me it may not be avoidable, uh, this talk of invoking the 25th Amendment. And it's coming as we are also uh, seeing signs of a uh, revolt among the White House staff. Uh, as Governor Christie mentioned, uh, there were not just one, but actually two members of the First Lady staff who have uh, resigned. I am also aware of at least three other uh, senior officials in the West Wing who are considering resigning tonight. And there you see uh, the 25th Amendment, which uh, uh, allows uh, for a majority vote of the president's cabinet uh, to remove him from office. Um, there's a uh, one major question in all of this that's, that's actually unclear, uh, which is there are so many acting secretaries in the Trump cabinet right now. Uh, it's unclear, at least to me, whether or not acting secretaries, for instance, we have an acting secretary uh, of defense, whether or not acting secretaries uh, would be part of that majority vote. But I am told this is a real this is a real discussion, and it includes at least some members of the Trump cabinet about the possibility of invoking the 25th Amendment. 25th Amendment, of course, would is supposed to be invoked in times of incapacitation uh, by the president. Let me bring back uh, Dan Abrams and Kate Shaw for a little bit more on this as the discussion now has been confirmed. Um, Dan, let me begin with you. Yes, this is a vote of the cabinet, but if the president contested it, and there's every reason to believe he would contest it, at this point it does go to the Congress, and in some ways it's a higher hurdle than impeachment. Right. Look, I don't think that this is a realistic scenario. I understand that people are talking about it. I understand that it's on the table. Um, I don't think uh, that it's realistic, A, because you have to get half the cabinet, B, because this really wasn't what the 25th Amendment was enacted to do. You can, you can make an argument that there are sections in there that could apply to it, but this really was enacted in the wake of the John Kennedy. Um, assassination and concern for the president in a situation where he'd been in a coma or completely incapacitated uh, such that he couldn't do his job. So I don't think in the end you're going to see this. But yes, if it were to happen, if they were to be able to get a majority uh, of the cabinet, um, the president could then fight it. And then, by the way, it's not supposed to be permanent, right? It can be a temporary thing. Um, so this is going to be discussed, but I don't expect there to be action on it. Kate Shaw? I'm, I'm less sure than Dan. I mean, I do think one thing we should say is it's a majority of the cabinet, um, but also requires the vice president. So it's not as though enough cabinet members uh, will get you there. You need the vice president and a majority of the cabinet. John Carl is right. It's actually not settled whether acting secretaries do count as members of the cabinet. This is a provision of the 25th Amendment that has never been invoked. It's typically used, as Dan says, um, you know, it, it's designed for incapacity, largely, uh, you know, designed with health incapacity in mind, physical health. Um, but I think its, it's words certainly would extend to a situation in which a majority of the cabinet and the vice president thinks the president is simply unfit for whatever reason uh, to continue in office. Um, and you're also right, George, that the bar is if the president fights it, um, Congress then makes the decision and it requires a two thirds vote in each House of Congress as opposed to just two thirds in the Senate to convict um, if we're talking about impeachment. So the 25th Amendment is in some ways a higher legal bar, but the wrinkle there is that Congress actually here, because we're so close to the end of President Trump's term, if if, I, if, if Pence and the cabinet invoke the 25th Amendment uh, and they write it down and they send that declaration to Congress, Pence automatically becomes acting president and Congress has three weeks to, to respond. Um, so they could just run the clock out and Pence would be able to continue the term, uh, to finish the term rather, just under the 25th Amendment. So, you know, I, I'm not surprised to hear that these conversations are active um, and, you know, it, it, it would in, in some ways be a more direct route if there's genuine concern with what might unfold in the next two Two weeks uh, than pursuing impeachment. David Muir, thank you, Kate. We heard those strong words from the vice president on the Senate floor, but boy, this would be a step that is almost impossible to imagine. Yeah, it's hard to even accept the fact that we're talking about the 25th Amendment here as we sit tonight. It, it's one more reflection of the heaviness of today in America and, and these last few weeks. 
Regardless of the conversation of the 25th Amendment, though, I think what will be fascinating in the days to come is looking at this relationship between the vice president and President Trump. It was long before we heard from the president today that we heard from Vice President Mike Pence, uh, who tweeted uh, quite quickly that the violence and destruction taking place at the U.S. Capitol must stop and it must stop now. Anyone involved must respect law enforcement officers and immediately leave the building. And that wasn't his only message. He went on to say peaceful protest is the right of every American, but this attack on our Capitol will not be tolerated and those involved will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. We did not hear that from President Trump when that one minute video was finally released. And when you think about the reporting from our political team earlier from Catherine Falders, John Santucci, John Carl about this potential that President Trump might have rebuffed uh, the National Guard being called in uh, at first, at least early in the day when we saw these protests. Uh, I, I took that information and then that, that reporting around six this evening. Uh, this tweet was somewhat remarkable for who it did not include. We heard from the National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien who tweeted about Vice President Mike Pence today, did not include President Trump in that tweet. He wrote, I just spoke with Vice President Pence. He is a genuinely fine and decent man. He exhibited courage today as he did at the Capitol on 9-11. As a congressman, I am proud uh, to serve with him. And one more note, Allison McCorn of our, our Washington team also uh, sent out a note uh, to our, our DL here describing the Senate chamber when the vice president spoke this evening, that you could hear a pin drop in the chamber. And when he was done in that rare ask to speak before the chamber, that there was applause from both sides. And we all know in this highly polarized time that that was a very rare moment. Um, appreciation for Vice President Mike Pence, not only from both parties up there on the Hill tonight, but from the National Security Advisor and other members of this administration. David Muir, thanks. What a difference, Lindsey Davis, from the beginning of the day today when this first objections were raised, a standing ovation of Republican silence from Democrats. Certainly a day of extremes. And, and when you look at that we started out with the most significant breach of the Capitol since the war of 1812. And I wanted to kind of pick up then on, on something that we saw inside that David mentioned uh, in the Capitol uh, on a much smaller level, but something that we haven't seen certainly in a long time, which the appearance of, of unity, the appearance of agreement across the aisle, not just with that standing ovation, but also there was nodding when Schumer talked about the people who have breached the Capitol should be prosecuted. Uh, and Joe Manchin, we heard from him earlier today when he said uh, it might be this horrible act that unites us and so many tonight across America are hoping he's right. Democratic Senator from West Virginia. I want to go to Sarah Fagan for more on this, Sarah. So we've seen more speeches from Republicans condemning what happened. Uh, the question now is even if something like the 25th Amendment isn't invoked and, and voted on, even if impeachment isn't pursued, the question of accountability does arise. We know the Democrats are going to pursue it. How should Republicans respond? Pick up on what Rahm Emanuel was talking about earlier. He said maybe the right compromise is a censure of the president. I don't often agree with Rahm, but I, I think he's on to something. Look, Republicans have to do something in a coordinated way. Whether it's the 25th Amendment, whether it's censure, whether the, the, the most simple thing would be for a group of members who've objected to these electors to stand up together and say, we are withdrawing our objections, maybe not because we're okay with everything that happened in the election, but simply as a statement to rebuff this president and his actions. Uh, I do think it's critical Republicans come together and do something, say something. I said earlier in our programming, that I don't think what happened on the Capitol reflects the party, uh, the Republican Party. I stand by that. I agree with that. But Republicans are going to own this if they they don't do something more aggressive than just statements. I thought President Bush's statement was very strong. Mitch McConnell has been very strong today. Mike Pence has been, I think, incredible today. But that alone is probably not enough. We there's got to be some organized act. And do you see any evidence of that happening? Well, look. The fact that there are members of the president's staff, senior staff, resigning and others talking about it, the fact that there's a mere conversation among some in the cabinet being you know, somewhat widely reported uh, tonight about the 25th Amendment. Look, the, the president certainly is physically capable of being the president. It's pretty unclear to me, it's pretty clear to me, I should say, that based on the events of the last few days, that he may not mentally be able to serve as the president. The fact that those conversations are happening, I think, uh, is important and it tells you a lot. I, I tend to agree that it probably won't come to that. Um, but uh, 
there's a building sentiment among Republicans uh, from, I think, not just the conservatives or the moderate Republicans, from conservatives and moderates alike, that we've got to take this a step farther. Whether it happens or not, we'll see. But the fact that these conversations are happening and the longer Trump sort of doesn't address this in a more meaningful way, the more likely that is to happen. Extraordinary that it's happening with 14 days to go in the president. But as you say, if you were listening to that, yeah. watch what happened today, listen to that phone call with the Georgia Secretary of State over the weekend. It did appear the president was living in a different world. You had to wonder, does he believe what he's saying or does he simply not know or is he simply making it up? I mean, I think he believes every word of it. I think he's convinced himself that this election was stolen. You know, look, I think for a long time, for many, many occurrences where Trump has done something, said something inappropriate, uh, you know, we, we've been quick to dismiss it as this is being Trump. Trump's just being Trump. That's Trump on Twitter. But it's not, and he's off doing policy. That's pretty good. And I think sometimes that's true. This week, that has not been true. You know, we saw him encourage this protest. We, he's not condemned it. Uh, he has fueled it, uh, you know, this conversation around the National Guard, if that ends up being true, uh, that is a, a very terrible thing for a sitting president to do. And there just has to be a more aggressive response to it.